what I'll be doing in the next 15 minutes is talking about how imaging of brain tumors has changed over the last decade or so and what is the current status of the role of MRI, including its multi-parametric parameters in terms of the current status. There have been several advances in brain tumor imaging over the last decade, decade and a half. The brain tumor imaging has changed completely from pure anatomical imaging to vascular, metabolic and functional imaging. Use of MRI as a diagnostic tool has progressed from completely anatomical imaging to functional imaging. This allows neurosurgeons to plan surgeries in a very, very sophisticated manner. It is effective in assessing treatment response when you are giving chemo or radiotherapy post-surgery. It differentiates true progression from pseudo-progression and it also differentiates true response from pseudo-response. And this has allowed the oncologist, the radiation oncologist and surgeons to understand the tumor behavior much better. It also allows a good detection and assessment of what is going to happen to the patient in a much sophisticated manner. So the routine conventional sequences in tumor imaging in central nervous system has moved from simple spin echo sequence, gradient echo sequence, fast spin echo sequence, inverse in recovery sequence, flare sequence, to a lot of new basic and advanced sequences in terms of MR spectroscopy, diffusion and diffusion tensor imaging, perfusion imaging, artery spin labeling, which is a part of perfusion imaging without having to inject contrast, the true functional imaging, which is bold imaging and fusion imaging. When these functional and structural imaging is combined together, it gives a complete information. This allows the medical oncologist, surgical team, and the radiation oncologist greater insights into grading of tumor, characterization of tumor, functional and anatomical localization of tumor. It also allows better understanding of secondary effects on the adjoining white matter tracts, eloquent cortices, etc. It allows better operative planning, response to treatment, as I said, pseudo response or true response. And it allows much more accurate information about whether there is a recurrence of the tumor or there are post-treatment changes. So tumor protocol has changed completely from just a simple lumbar imaging to functional imaging. And that's what we are going to understand in next 15 minutes. So each of these new sequences provide very unique information, which when combined together has implications for defining the tumor type and grade better, directing biopsy or surgical resection better, planning radiation and biological therapies in a much accurate way. It also assesses the treatment response much earlier, quicker and better than what we were doing before. And it also allows the researchers understanding mechanism of success and failure of newer treatments, typically anti-angiogenesis therapy. So what are the newer sequences in MRI that allow this functional information better? So you have spectroscopy, diffusion tensor imaging, perfusion imaging, arterial spin labeling, functional MRI, and fusion imaging. In this part of the lecture, we are going to cover only spectroscopy and diffusion and diffusion tensor imaging. And in the next part, we are going to cover the other four sequences. So let's start with understanding spectroscopy and its role in differentiating malignant brain tumors from benign ones. There is a lot of data available across literature, but what is by and large followed is this meta-analysis covered by AJNR in 2006, which talks about higher ratios of choline upon creatine with cutoff of two choline upon NA with cutoff of 2.2 and choline plus creatine upon NA and creatine upon NA to decide that you are dealing with a high-grade tumor. Lower ratios of lipid upon lactate and creatine upon lactate 
is also considered as a patient suffering from high grade tumor. Metastasis can be differentiated from high grade dimers by presence of high lipid creatine ratio. So, what are the practical applications of MR spectroscopy? It distinguishes abnormalities with same imaging appearances. And the examples are differentiating tumor from radiation necrosis, differentiating cystic tumor from abscess, differentiating metastasis from astrocytoma or gliomas, and differentiating toxoplasma from lymphoma when patient is immunocompromised. And here are actual examples. So these two lesions morphologically look quite similar, although the size is different, and it will be virtually impossible to differentiate glioma from metastasis. Then look at spectroscopy. So if we have presence of MI and presence of creatine, that indicates that you are dealing with glioma. Also, in the peritumoral area, what looks like edema, if you have presence of choline, that indicates you are dealing with an astrocytoma or glioma. Metastasis, on the other hand, will have complete absence of intratumoral choline as well as intratumoral MI. It will show a lot of lipid which will be absent in glioma. So that is the way to differentiate glioma or primary tumors of brain versus metastasis. Lymphoma can be differentiated from these two entities by presence of what is called as twin peak sign. So when you have two tall peaks of liquid lactate and choline, you know you are dealing with lymphoma. Oligodendroglioma, on the other hand, will have relatively low choline, high creatine, and high MI glycine. So it's impossible to differentiate glycine from MI because both resonate at the same location. Also, if you add the presence of tumor mainly in the gray matter with infinity pattern, you know you're dealing with oligodendroglioma and not astrocytoma or glioblastoma. Radiation necrosis can be differentiated from recurrence of a tumor by tall lipid lactate peak from 0.9 to 1.3 ppm with relatively low choline. So when you have post-tumor bed evaluation, you want to differentiate recurrence of a tumor from radiation necrosis, run a multivoxel spectroscopy and look for in the tumor bed presence of high choline. That would indicate presence of recurrence. If across all the voxels, there is only high lipid and nothing else, you know you are dealing with radiation necrosis. So radiation necrosis will have low choline, high lipid lactate, tumor recurrence will have high choline and high choline NA ratio. So that is about the role of MR spectroscopy in brain tumor imaging. Let's now move on and see how diffusion and diffusion tensor imaging helps us in differentiating high-grade gliomas from low-grade gliomas or any other entities. How does diffusion work? It is basically an index of free motion of water in the intra and extracellular compartment of the brain cells. Anything that has high viscosity or high membrane would impede motion and then will show restricted, uh, restricted diffusion. So any lesion with high cellularity, so we are talking about high-grade glioma, will have restricted diffusion. Anything that contains pus, so we are typically talking about abscess, will show restricted diffusion. So restricted diffusion will be seen in abscesses and high-grade cellular, that means high-grade tumors. Based on this, again, the same article of AJNR in 2006, allows us to talk about differentiating high-grade glamours from low-grade glamours by looking at diffusivity. So high-grade glamours will show a lot of restricted diffusion, low-grade glamours will show facilitation of diffusion, intermediate grade glamours will show relatively less restricted diffusion. Abscesses will show restricted diffusion in the center, whereas if it is a cystic tumour, the solid component or peripheral component of the cystic tumor would show restricted diffusion. 
Diffusion tensor imaging is an extension of diffusion segments, a non-invasive way of understanding brain structural connectivity. It also allows us to look at microscopic axonal organization of white matter tracts and based on the directional rate of diffusion of water molecules, we can see where the diffusion is facilitated more and where it is not. So a little bit of more understanding of diffusion tensor imaging. When we say that hydrogen atoms in the inter and extracellular compartments are flowing at a rate of 5 centimeters per minute, that's not a complete truth. So along the white matter tracks, the water molecules are moving at 5 centimeters per minute. Perpendicular to it, the diffusivity is virtually zero. And what we see in tumors and in lesion is something in between. So we calculate fractional anisotropy and look at how the diffusion is. So wherever diffusion is maximum, you will see more restricted diffusion, that is in high-grade tumors. And when it is lesser, you will see facilitation of diffusion. That is called as FA. And based on the fractional anisotropy, tracts which are in transverse axis are labeled as red, those superior inferior are labeled as blue, and those anteroposterior are labeled as green. And color use depend on the intensity of FA. What are the practical clinical applications of DTI? It allows tract specific localization of white matter lesions. It allows localization of tumors in relation to white matter tracts. It differentiates infiltration from deflection, and that is important in grading the tumors. It allows localization of main white matter tracts for neurosurgical planning. And it also detects occult white matter invasion by high grade glymars. So, based on the pattern of DTI, you can actually decide which tumor you are dealing with. For example, in glymas and metastasis, the tracts will be displaced, whereas in anaplastic, astrocytoma and GBMs, the tracts will be infiltrated, but they will remain identifiable. In very high-grade anaplastic, astrocytomas and glymas, tracts will be completely disrupted, whereas in metastasis and in edema, the tracts will be normal, but just displaced with slight change in the color view. And these are the actual example. This is a left frontal lobe oligodendroglioma. The tracts here are displaced but not infiltrated. Compare that with another pontine glioma, which is a lower glioma. Again, the tracts are displaced and not invaded. Compare these two patients with this patient of the one that I showed you before. A glioblastoma multiform in left temporal lobe. The tracts are completely destroyed. Here is another example of DNET in the left posterior frontal cortex. The tracts are displaced, color use are slightly changed, but there is no infiltration. So that is the importance of diffusion and diffusion tensor imaging in advanced tumor imaging. Perfusion, arterial spin labeling, functional MRI and fusion imaging will cover in the next talk. So to conclude this part of the talk, with integration of conventional and advanced imaging techniques, we can provide increasingly detailed information about the underlying pathology. These details will aid in improving our understanding of brain tumors and help in development of new treatment strategies in future. What we also need to understand is radiology has to be both image-centric and patient-centric. We must understand that we are an important and an integral part of patient treatment. Interspecialty communication and coordination is most important. And we must aim to change from volume-based to value-based imaging, from interpretation focus to outcome-focused reporting, and the responsibility of training our future generation with not only the advances, but these values lies with us. Thank you for your attention.